You are listening to The Scope, Phelps Health Podcast, Episode 16. Today we're talking about going back to school and what that means for parents. Let's get started. Hi everybody, I'm your host Paige Hyman. The Scope Podcast is produced on a regular basis and can be found by visiting phelpshealth.org. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your SoundCloud stream or subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. All links can be found in the show notes. Let's get into the show. Today, our guest is Dr. Forrest Rackham, a clinical psychologist with Phelps Health Medical Group. Welcome back to our show. I know we just had you. Yes, we did. Yeah, <laughs> no, I really appreciate being able to be here. With yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I know we're talking about a lot of really important things today. Right. So we just talked about professionals and educators and what going back to school is going to look like for them. But on this podcast specifically, we're going to talk about parents. Yes. Because they have undertaken a lot during COVID-19, right? Yeah, they have. And yeah. you're a parent and you're a professional as well. So tell me a little bit about your experience. Yeah, no, that's a good one. Um, I My experience, I, I can only speak a little bit more mm-hmm. from my wife's experience. Uh, my experience has been that when I was at work, I was at work, mm-hmm. I'd come home, and some of the kids were having difficulties with homework. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we experienced together uh, is that... Uh, some kids needed a little bit more help than others. Mm-hmm. Some of our kids, they would get up at 7.30 in the morning, do their homework, and they were done by like 9. Yeah. And they were That's super a pretty low kid. Right, right exactly. <laughs> they were done, and they were like, I get to still do my drawing, I get to do mm-hmm. my art, I get to hang out, and uh, all those things. One of our other kids uh, really was getting frustrated and bored. Um, and he, it would take him hours to get done with the mm-hmm. schoolwork that would normally take only 10 minutes. Um, so my wife ended up having to uh, find some things that would challenge him a little bit more. Mm-hmm. She gave it to him, and then he got done a lot more quickly because it was challenging. It allowed him to get things wrong. Uh, and so it was it was a unique opportunity to see the kids' different strengths mm-hmm. and uh, their different growth edges that they're working on. That's really cool that your child needed to be challenged more, and he was right. just bored with the homework. That's really what it is. Yeah. Because we're going to continue to see that into the next school year, uh-huh. because a lot of new challenges are going to arise for parents and for educators, yeah. but specifically for parents, because their children are still going to have the opportunity to learn from home or to learn at school this year. Yes. So not only are the parents going to be working from home or working full time, they're also probably going to be doing a little bit of teaching again. <laughs> yes, they will. So they need to buckle up and get ready. Right, exactly. <laughs> so a big question that I have for parents is, how can they keep their kids safe from COVID-19 when they go back to school? Because they're probably going to be doing a little bit of both. Um, I think uh, uh, really having a family meeting. Mm-hmm talking about it, practicing it, actually. Mm -hmm. I I am a big fan of role playing. Okay. (laughs) So uh, together as a family, throwing obstacles at each other. Mm -hmm. Well, what's going to happen if uh, your mask breaks? Yeah, it's Um, like a fire drill. Yeah, what do you do? Exactly, Mm -hmm. like a a family fire drill, but a family mask drill. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so talking about different strategies, having the kids come up with unique ideas that uh, would come up, and then practicing. What would you do in this situation? Mm -hmm. And then having kids making a fun game out of it as a, like a little family meeting mm-hmm. uh, a couple times maybe before school starts. Yeah, maybe that they way, can go mask shopping. Right, it might be also <laughs> mask shopping too. But I, I think uh, making the game out of it, uh, talking about it as a family, uh, role playing different uh, scenarios that might come mm-hmm. up and then also how they might be able to accomplish or uh, successfully go through those role plays. Then I think in those re- in that respect, then I think the mm-hmm. kids will They'll already have it in their mind. They already yeah. have practiced it out. They're like, okay, well, I remember this. Mm-hmm. I can just. So here's a good else. role play that just came to my mind. Yes. Whenever students wear masks, I could see some students who aren't wearing masks getting made fun of, right? Or, the, or vice versa. Or vice versa. Yes. yes. How do we handle that as as parents or even as children? Yeah. So our our kids, even when our kids have gone out in public settings, uh, our kids we all generally wear masks uh, mm-hmm. in public settings, and. Our kids have noticed that they're one of the few that are wearing Mm -hmm. masks sometimes. And so they, we just say, this is what clan zigs do. And so (laughs) clan zigs is a a group name that we came up with for our family, uh, taking the first letter of every kid's name. um, And that way we just, we call ourselves clan zigs. Yeah, Um, that's cool. Yeah. And so we say, what do clan zigs do? Clan zigs do hard things, but also just practicing it out with the kids and talking about it. I, I think it's important to talk about principles of, uh, hey, there are going to be other kids that don't have the same parenting strategies that your other kids do, whatever, or they don't have fa- the same fi- family code or family uh, kind of rules. 
-hmm. and that's okay. Uh, we've emphasized to our kids from personal experience, we are there to still show kindness and respect and courtesy toward other people, even if they have different values than we do. And the biggest thing that we can do is to show them kindness and respect. Now, how does that protect against bullying? Um, we've talked about it. Mm -hmm. We've talked about different ways in which they can protect against it. Um, but I think it's something that even our family needs to talk a little bit more about because there's going to be times that they're going to be um, ostracized, maybe. Yeah, and put in really hard situations. And I think it, it could be something that with the climate that's happening right now, in some respects, we can uh, humanize other people. So how do parents also normalize the situation that, that we're in right now? Because we're wearing masks, we're, we're in a really volatile situation mm -hmm. in the United States. And it's so it feels so long term. Yeah. So how do we have those really tough conversations? How do we say we, you know, plans says do hard things? Right. Um, I think it's good to look back at the history and look back at certain things that were not normal at mm -hmm. one time. Uh, in the previous podcast, or I don't know if we talked about it beforehand, but we talked about seatbelts mm -hmm. and about how um, seatbelts at one time were not a law mm -hmm. uh, and that now people just are expected to wear seatbelts and they just do it. And it's normal for people to wear seatbelts. It's mm -hmm. abnormal for them not to, but people will still choose not to wear seatbelts. And that's nothing, uh, that's something that I think if we normalize it, one, mm -hmm. I remember when my parents started wearing seatbelts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then we pick on my dad for not wearing seatbelts. Uh -huh. Dad, you're not wearing your seatbelt. Um, but when my parents wore seatbelts more regularly, it also taught me that that's just what you do. So it's important, I think, for parents to model it themselves and even to be like, oh, where's my mask, honey? Uh, or, you know. Yeah, you have to practice what you preach. Yeah, put it on. Okay, I got my mask. Thank you very much. I love that. I get, not that they love that I get to wear a mask, uh -huh. but uh, just emphasizing that it's just. A normal thing that they wear that yeah because they they're going to see that and they're going to emulate whatever you're doing because yeah. you can preach it all day long but unless you're actively doing it they're not going to care exactly so i in order to have kids be, for it to become more regular mm -hmm. parents need to just model it themselves yeah now that's going to put a lot of stress on parents not just the mask wearing because we know that that's been stressful in and of itself uh -huh. probably just like how seat belts were stressful whenever they first came around right but how do parents deal with the stress that's been put on them to now be like part-time or full-time educators, be full-time parents, be full-time workers? That's three jobs right there. It is. Housekeepers. It is. Yeah. Cookers. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's like being a stay-at-home mom. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because a stay-at-home mom yes. has all those jobs. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Um, I would think that the uh, best thing to do is also to find some space for yourself. Mm -hmm. Create some space. Mm -hmm. Create some structure so that you can be able to have your own time it's important to uh but you feel like guilt with that with creating your own space because you want to provide for all the people around you you do and at the same time those people who are able to create their own space mm -hmm. uh, and are able to practice self-care mm -hmm. it actually benefits the other person if we thought if we've we've talked about mindfulness in the past mm -hmm. research has indicated those people who practice mindfulness are also better able to be, to be able to meet other people's needs, be more compassionate toward other people, and also to uh, have better relationships for other people. So by taking care of yourself, you're also taking care of other people. Mm -hmm. So if we keep that in our mind that uh, this is for other people, that sometimes is the winner, mm -hmm. especially for people that are like, I have that guilt that comes up with it. Yes. And guilt is gonna come up no matter what. Mm -hmm. I think if you're human, you're gonna have guilt. And so, welcome to the family. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't mean to say it uh, blasé, but I say it's normal to feel guilt, and that's okay. Now, what about shame? Shame is uh, is a different thing uh, altogether. Uh, Shame's a tough one. Shame and guilt, uh, a lot of times people view mm -hmm. those as synonymous, but there's slight difference. Yes. Guilt is one uh, that it's more behavior directed. You're looking at the mm -hmm. behaviors and saying, oh, that behavior was not a good thing. I need to change the behavior. And it's more future oriented yes. in terms of making some changes. Shame is more kind of like, uh, it makes someone want to shrink in mm -hmm. and wants them to kind of avoid kind of making changes because it, the shame is more about them as a person. Like, yeah. I am shame. Um, so I, I think the biggest thing that we want to do is focus more on the behaviors mm -hmm. that we're doing, uh, focus on the behaviors of other people 
then we're less likely to focus on how we are failing as a person, mm -hmm. but maybe that behavior itself yeah. failed. And that, that's okay. I fail all the time, trust me. <laughs> we all do, we're human, right? Like, that's exactly. human nature. Exactly. We're never gonna be 100% perfect. Yeah. And that's what's really important. Well, and Brene Brown talks about this too. It's, it's really important to not shame ourselves because whenever we do that, it leaves no room for growth. Right. Because all we do, it's like what you just said, we shrink ourselves into this corner. So especially as parents, we can't shame ourselves before school even gets started for our kids. We have to go out and take that spot in because it's for our kids. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one thing that I, I can think of as parents uh, mm -hmm. that some of them will struggle with is, did I do enough to protect my kid? Mm -hmm. Especially if anybody gets that uh, COVID or yes, coronavirus in the house. Uh, then they'll think, oh my goodness, did I do enough? Mm -hmm. And they might lay awake at night. Uh, they might have said, I should have taken these protective mm -hmm. measures. Uh, but people say hindsight is twenty twenty, but also hindsight is also something that kind of can beat us up. Yes. Uh, and so in that regard, be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. You can't anticipate every single scenario. You can only do the best you can. Right. And that's all you can do. Right, yeah. Take the best precautionary measures that you can and recognize that everybody makes mm -hmm. mistakes. There's going to be a time that maybe you didn't protect uh, the, your child well enough and they might have been exposed. That's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be happen even if you've done all the protective measures that you could have done. Children could still get exposed. Yeah, well that could still happen to the parents too. Yes because they're going to work or they might have to go out and get groceries or whatever it is. Yeah. So another question that I have is for lower income areas, you know, parents might be facing greater hardships because they can't drive their child to school. So they might have to ride the school bus or they might have to go to school and they can't work from home or do school from home because they either don't have access to internet or if they go to school, those are the only meals that they get. So how do they deal with that? Yeah. Um, and this is this is one hard one I've pondered about. Mm -hmm. Some people in Canada are like doing uh, double bubbles or something like that, where okay. they, where they team up with another family mm -hmm. uh, to be able to help each other out. Oh, um, cool! Uh, and that that poses risks. That poses uh, some mm -hmm. problems because uh, if you're teaming up with another family to help, like maybe doing childcare mm -hmm. or being able to uh, run the kids back and forth to different activities, uh, there's no promise that that other family is also. Uh, practicing physical distancing mm -hmm. either. And so all the other people they got, are getting exposed to could also potentially expose that other family. And so that's the, there's a risk, risk that reward. Come, right, mm -hmm. there's a risk reward. One, I'm able to, my kids are being looked at by someone with whom I trust. And then I also get to do the same thing for that same family. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, there's potential for exposure. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be a potential for exposure uh, yeah. on all elements. So. I think the best thing to do would to be kind of wait out as a family and to have a family meeting to mm -hmm. kind of talk about their risks versus rewards. Be intentional about how you're going to do it uh, mm -hmm. because any behavior that we do is going to have some kind of risk or reward with it. Yeah, and to be honest with our children too because sports, extracurricular activities, those are all going to look very different this year. So even if they do it, parents or families may elect not to let their children do it this year just because it may be unsafe. Uh -huh. Because of the travel, the exposure, the risk, yeah. it, it just may not be worth the reward at this point. Exactly. When we think about like basketball, mm -hmm. some kids that love black basketball and are future rising basketball stars, yes. that's like the, in their blood. Mm -hmm. uh, and to think that some of them might not be able to play basketball because yeah. basketball is It's engages, detrimental for them. Right? Physical touch, we're breathing on each other mm -hmm. and everything like that. Yeah, it's a contact sport. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So. That would be difficult in and of itself as yeah. well. Yeah, but what are some good things that we can glean from those difficult conversations? Do you think those students are going to be able to have resiliency later in life because they've been able to go through such a difficult time? If we model it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if uh, resilience is something that can be taught, it can be practiced, mm -hmm. it can be uh, uh, strengthened. Um, uh, it's something that uh, doesn't always come naturally to some people. Mm -hmm children and, and adults who are going through these difficulties can be resilient, but it has to be some, a lot of times I think it's something that should be practiced a lot more. Absolutely. Now, what does modeling look like for parents and for their children and students right now? Because it's like what you say, the parents have to model it. So how do parents implement goal setting in their house and for school? Because right. sometimes school might be in the house. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Uh, that's uh, the thought that came to my mind of agile programming for families. Okay, so what is that? Agile programming for families. There's a TED talk that was uh, one of the first TED talks that was mm -hmm. out there uh, by Bruce Feiler. He emphasizes uh, agile programming, which is that you do kind of weekly conversations with the family. It doesn't mm -hmm. be, need to be too long. It could be 15, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. five minutes, depending on the age of the kids. But it's where you come together as a family and say, okay, what was our goal for this week? Mm -hmm. How did we do on the goal? Let the kids be kind of the, the front runners of talking about that as well. And as you're talking about that, okay, so what is our goal? Do we want to continue with that goal as a family or do we want to change that goal? and allow the kids to be able to also say, okay, what will be the consequences if we don't reach that goal? So uh, he used the example of the kids, it, they want to make a goal of being able to answer the door more quickly to invite their guests into the house. Okay. Uh, and so he had said that sometimes his kids are little Stalins because they would, uh, they would emphasize that we'll have to go without uh, certain privileges for a week or a month. Wow. <laughs> and so sometimes parents Hardcore. have to, right. Sometimes parents have to calm, calm it down and uh -huh. say, uh, maybe, uh, missing out on a point or a day or something yeah. like that. I don't know. A whole week, man. <laughs> exactly. Imagine them as parents. <laughs> I know, I know. But oftentimes kids are a little bit more harsher on themselves if you uh -huh. ask them about punishment. So you talk about this. It makes me wonder, do kids who are in actively involved in these problem solving processes or these, um, like weekly meetings with their family, do they generally do a lot better because they're involved? They do. They do uh, because kids also want some level of control mm -hmm. uh, with COVID-19 and coronavirus. They've lost certain, all of it. They've lost all of it. Mm -hmm. Parents feel like they're powerless and they have no control. Being able to engage in a process of uh, problem solving together as a family mm -hmm. uh, exerts a certain level of control. Do you think that helps a family become stronger too as a family unit? Uh, yeah, uh, because uh, everyone's involved in the problem solving. You, it's, mm -hmm. it's more of a team effort. It's ra rather than mm -hmm. that's the problem and that kid is the one that has the problem. Uh, and instead, it's like, this is the problem we're all experiencing. How can we help manage mm -hmm. that problem together as a family? Yeah. Well, it also makes me think, too, that you come to the table and you if you look at the problem. You don't look at the individual people. Exactly. Right? And I think that's really important to recognize, too, is that we're all having this one issue. Let's look at the issue and figure out how we can all solve it together. Exactly. Because yeah. it's going to make us a better family. It would. Yeah. And that that's not just with kids. That happens in adults, too. Mm -hmm. And so, as we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. about uh, what can people have who have lower socioeconomic status or who have mm -hmm. difficulties. Um, I think any family then that is doing that, regardless of socioeconomic status or anything, are more likely to have a successful family unit mm -hmm. and are more likely to be able to come out of this more resilient mm -hmm. and uh, a stronger, yeah, just stronger family unit and better problem solvers. So is that a way that those um, families from lower socioeconomic statuses, is that a way that they can learn how to cope during this time is to maybe start having family meetings? Yeah. yeah. That's, I think that's really great advice. Even with parents, do you think it's important for parents to have schedules at home for their children and to have like recess times yes. for their younger kids? Yeah. What does that uh, look like? Well, it, it's some, again, maybe through that family uh, right. meeting that you guys have together. Yeah. Um, but it's where you structure out the day and mm -hmm. say, you know, uh, we have opted for our family to be at home uh, mm -hmm. during the school year. So this is the structure that we have based upon when you guys have classes and different things mm -hmm. like that. Um, sometimes it's good to just have like benchmarks in terms of these are what we expect for you to do throughout the day. And you have to have these things done by this time, especially if, if you have kids that have different schedules. Mm -hmm. So it could be, I expect you to have some physical activity outside or to have, do some uh, jumping up and down or to do uh, dance fit or whatever mm -hmm. in front of the TV, um, but I need some movement from you. Um, I need you to engage with reading uh, your extracurricular mm -hmm. books or whatever. And having that structure in yes. place, they know that, okay, that's on my checkoff list. I have to do that. Yes, I imagine whenever you say a checkoff list, list, like a big, huge whiteboard with like, it's a family of five and three of them are kids and the mom and dad have their schedule written off and everybody has stickers or check marks and they check it off throughout the day. Yeah. Like dad did his exercise and mom did hers and so-and-so did theirs. Because to me, if you can see it and visualize it, it's, yeah. it's easier to, to know that you've accomplished something. Yeah. And we have a, at our house, we have laminated mm -hmm. paper where kids can take dry erase markers. Oh, and that's cool. Like, they, they did their mm -hmm. reading. They did their physical activity. They uh, did their meditation. 
They, yeah. uh, and so they check it off, they check out, mm -hmm. they made their bed. <laughs> what a great feeling of accomplishment though, to right. be able to like, check those things off and say, I did that. Today I accomplished. Right. And especially if it's tied with privileges. So mm -hmm. you did all those things, then you get to be able to have some extra time with uh, Minecraft or mm -hmm. being able to do this. Uh, and then the kids can be like, I did that. I worked hard for that. And I did my schoolwork at the same time. Yes. And it builds confidence and it builds their, um, their resilience, like you said earlier. Yeah. So then they're able to be really protective adults, which is really what you want out of kids, right? <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I really am in a firm belief that we need to be more intentional as parents. And so that means that uh, sometimes coming up with a family uh, motto, coming mm -hmm. up with a family plan, coming out up with the, uh, their, uh, uh, all of a sudden I can't think of what, what I'm thinking about, but the, the family mission plan. Mm -hmm. um, and so even sharing with the kids, and having them come up with it with you and stuff like that, then having that intentionality of being intentional about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, we, when everybody's working in a business or they're running their own practice or they're running their own classroom. You have, have all of those elements. You have all business. those elements in your mind mm -hmm. that you're already doing in those things. Let's take what works in the school, what works in business, what works in other avenues. Let's take it at home. And be intentional. When I ask other parents sometimes, what's your mission plan? They look at me like, what? Mm -hmm. What's your mission statement for your family? And they, they have no idea. Yeah. And so I have not met too many people that have. But when I have met parents that have that, oh, this is what we do together as a family. We work together. We play together. And we celebrate success. Okay. And so I, I remember visiting with a family that had that kind of mission plan. And they, there's this warmth that they had about each other. Did they have squabbles? Did they have disagreements? Absolutely. Yes, they did. And yet you saw this as a unique family uh, unit that was willing to build upon each other. And they did great. Mm -hmm. They did awesome. Let's hit the opposite of that. Okay. So what are some questions that those families and parents can ask themselves when they're feeling overwhelmed or stressed? Mm -hmm. Whether it's dealing with the school year, COVID-19, children at home because they're doing a lot of jobs. I would go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. Am I getting enough sleep? Mm -hmm. Are the kids going to bed at time? Am I getting to bed on time? Am I eating my vegetables? <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but research has indicated that when we, when we increase our vegetable intake, mm -hmm. it decreases stress hormones and depressive symptoms. Uh, so vegetables, mm -hmm. exercise, sleep, those things. Um, I, would, I would ask myself, am I doing those things? Mm -hmm. And then I would go through, uh, if, if we had like a troubleshooting guide, yeah. which actually there's a, a, a program on Coursera. It's called Everyday Parenting, the ABCs of Child Rearing. Okay. And on there, uh, there on week three, it talks about troubleshooting part one and troubleshooting part two. Mm -hmm. But on there, it, it almost has go, goes through troubleshooting. If your kids are misbehaving and whatever you're doing is not working, what can you do? Mm -hmm. Have you done this? Have you done this? Have you done this? So I think in some regard, Creating your own family troubleshooting guide. <laughs> did did mm -hmm. I get my morning exercise? Mm -hmm. Did uh, did I have I, my veggies? <laughs> right. Did I have my veggies? Am I getting enough sleep? Am mm -hmm. I also getting enough dating time with my wife, mm -hmm. or whatever? Are we having our own own alone time mm -hmm. because we're all cramped inside this house? Yeah. What are the things that are needs? going through the cracks? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think identifying what those things are are important to the family, and then also to the couple, and also to the parents, um, and then. Make a list so you can go through that troubleshooting mm -hmm. guide, especially when you're going in the in the dregs of hopelessness or you're feeling down and out. Mm -hmm. Having a troubleshooting guide is something that, that you can look at and be like, oh, yeah, I haven't done that. Or, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a playbook. It's you a can playbook. go to and look at and be like, okay, let's go through this. Let's see what's going on. Right. Yeah. And yeah. you already have it made so you don't have to fumble around and try to look up stuff on the Internet because you already have it. Exactly. It's already there for you. And that's the hard part I, I want to emphasize to a lot of parents is, do the hard part of planning out now mm -hmm. so that then uh, when you do go into the situations, when you're feeling down and out and you can't think because you're so emotional fraught, mm -hmm. have that trooper shooting guide that you've already worked on. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of hard work at the front end, but then when you, when you have it already in place, you'll be glad that you looked at it, that you did that and did the hard work with your family, even though it's so boring sometimes <laughs> to come up with the trouble shooting guide. It's so boring to think about what ifs. So that's a great segue to give you a couple of minutes to wrap up the end of our show and give any advice into um, what COVID-19 might look like for parents for this next school year. Yeah. So to those parents that are listening to the, this podcast or watching it right now, um, 
change is a constant. That's one thing that we know for sure, it's change. Um, one of the things that contributes most to stress is change, any kind of change, especially change that we are not anticipating. And so hang in there. If you're feeling stressed, I imagine who wouldn't at this moment? You're human, so hang in there. It's going to, it's going to continuously uh, change throughout time. Do those things that you need to do for yourself that are constant. Uh, taking a, a warm bath, taking some time to yourself so that then you know that amidst all these changes, this is at least one thing that I can look forward to. And hang in there because I know it's not easy. Um, I'm a parent myself, so there are some times that I struggle a lot. <laughs> so hang in there. Great advice. I think something we all needed to hear. Thanks so much for listening to this go. If you liked our show and would like to know more, check out pubsalt.org. Thanks so much.